Okay, so I will be talking about um, I will be talking about some recent uh, recent advances in the study of the inviscid limit and the parental system. Inviscid limit and. the study of the parental system. Okay. Um, so when we talk about the inviscid limit, when we talk about the inviscid limit, usually we have in mind the limit going from Navier-Stokes to Euler. Uh, I mean, sometimes it can, this can happen in different uh, uh, equations with different boundary conditions. Um, but um, let me write down exactly what I mean by that first. So we take the equation dTu plus u grad u minus mu Laplace nu. The divergence of u is zero and we start with some initial data. Okay. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, usually we consider this in some domain omega. And uh, we need boundary conditions. We need boundary conditions. OK, the regular one is that u is equal to 0 on the boundary. So u, u here is the velocity, nu is the viscosity, p is the pressure. So usually I will write down u as a function of t and x. Uh, you are thinking x in R2 or x in R1? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to say this. So omega is in R2 or R3. Okay, we can we can also study the problem in any dimension, but um, it will be more interesting if we are in uh, two or three dimensions. So u is again the velocity, which is a vector in R two or R three. Okay, so concerning like the boundary conditions, this will be. Uh, the most interesting boundary condition we would like to understand, which is uh, u equals 0 on the boundary. Um, we have some other boundary conditions. Um, so this is Dirichlet. We have also a Navier boundary condition, which says that u dot n equals 0. So this means no penetration. And the second, I mean, it comes with um, some condition on the stress. So the fact that um, S of U and the tangential part of this equal either 0 or sometimes we can put minus alpha u um, u tangential or I can write u because u u is just u tangential on the boundary so um, what is s here s of u is the symmetric part of of the gradient okay um, so this is, I mean, we can call it Navier or like Robin type boundary condition. Um, it turns out that the problem is simpler if we look at this boundary condition rather than the first one. Okay. Um, okay, so 
We can also look at the problem without boundary conditions, right? We can also study the problem. Um, so th the third case will be, let's say, omega equal um, Tn, uh, T Td, or Rd, or like, I mean, people study also the problem on manifolds, let's say, manifold without boundary, or I mean, like, one can also push it to uh, more geometric settings, like where you don't have a boundary, okay? So, so but the, the point here is we have either the most difficult case is the Dirichlet boundary condition, we have some other type of boundary condition, let's say Navier, we have no boundary conditions. I mean, there is another type of boundary conditions and uh, where there is also quite a quite number of works, which is like uh, boundary conditions where you put some penetrating fluid. So, um, I mean, here when I say u dot n equals zero, this means no penetration. Uh, but there are other boundary conditions where we allow uh, some incoming fluid. Uh, so incoming boundary condition. I will not really talk about this, but um, there is uh, there is some literature about about this. In particular, I know, like I mean, I can mention works of uh, Temam and uh, Wong, who did a lot of work on this incoming boundary condition. Um, okay, so again, here maybe I should re uh, uh, mention again the what I mean by n. n is the is the normal. Usually, my normal is the. This is the normal, and uh, what I mean by tangential means the tangential part of the vector, right? So, s of u. S of u is like a matrix, is a symmetric matrix. You are taking S of, S of u dot n, this is a vector. This is a vector on the boundary, and then you are looking at the tangential part of it, right? The tangential part of it. So, um, so for instance, if you have a vector v uh, on the boundary, you can always write it as, um, V tangential plus V dot N N. Okay, so it's, it's just you are projecting to the tangential part. And of course, this works either you are in two or three dimension or even in any dimension. Okay, so um, so more or less this is the, the, the setup. You start with Navier Stokes with. Um, with a viscosity nu, and I mean, usually when you study Navier Stokes with a fixed viscosity, we'll talk about u. But now, if you are studying the problem with a viscosity that is varying, so nu is varying, so usually you will call uh, you will call your solution u nu, right? Because it depends on u. Um, or sometimes, okay, you can. We can call it un, un, and then we have a new n. Um, okay, so it's it's the same. Oh, maybe n is a bad notation, but okay. Right, and then the the question the question you want to understand is what happens. So you are thinking about uh, as if you have a sequence, a new n, new n is going to zero. New n is a sequence of uh, viscosity is going to zero, and you want to understand what happens to u n. Okay. Now, formally, if we study this limit formally, what we expect, um, we expect that. Maybe I can write it there. 
So we expect that the viscosity term disappears. So we expect we expect U n to converge to something that we call U zero. That now will solve um, solves Euler, namely the following equation. And u0 at t equals 0 equal to the initial data. Okay. Now the whole question is what are the boundary conditions that we, we have to impose? Um, it's clear that um, for Navier-Stokes we can impose u equals 0 on the boundary, so it's um, let's say if we are in three dimensions and this as if we are imposing three conditions um, it turns out for oil and this is because of the parabolic nature of the equation for Euler for Euler we cannot impose uh, that same boundary condition and we can only impose that the non-penetration so if I'm taking one or two if I'm taking one or two the boundary condition that normally we should get at the limit is just u0 dot n equals 0. This will be my boundary condition. Either I start with 1 or 2. Meaning that uh, this condition will disappear at the limit if I am in the Navier case. And also the condition on the tangential part of u will disappear there. Okay. Uh. Uh, may I ask you one question, just by curiosity? Uh, if you're in the uh, case number three, uh, you don't have a boundary. Uh, yeah. So I, I'll I'll talk about that. Yeah. So that's that's the simple case. That's the simple case, and there are works on that. So I'll I'll mention a few works about it. Uh, um, yeah, so case three is the easy case, right? So, I mean, in terms of, uh, in terms of difficulties, I will say this is easy. Uh, this is, I mean, in, in terms of level of difficulty, this is easy, slightly more complicated, slightly more complicated and one is open, right? So in terms of which one is easy, this is the easiest case because, okay, I mean, it's, uh, it's just a, a simple energy estimates and, uh, and maybe I'll, 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 I'll do it on the blackboard. This is really easy. This is also not very difficult because somehow in this case, we can still keep something from this incoming boundary conditions. So the incoming boundary condition, you can still keep it here because somehow you are not degenerate, so you can still impose, you can still keep something. Um, this case, um, this case is um, easier than the first one, but still you need to, to do something. Uh -huh. I have another question. Is there any constraint on the pressure term gradient of P? Um, P? P is a Lagrange multiplier for the divergence free condition. So, um, so in general, when we do, when we look at the incompressible Navier Stokes, okay, the pressure, we don't uh, worry about it too much. Um, it's true that. Um, I mean, it disappears when we do energy estimates. Um, but of course, now when we talk about the parental system, okay, the pressure, we have, we have to say something about the pressure and so on, yeah. Okay, other questions or? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so l let's, um, 
let me let me start by um, I, I will I will first I will first try to explain the the difficulty the difficulty with uh, um, or 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 let me let me I, I think I think I will do is uh, let me do your what you suggested uh, from let let's start by case three right let me start by case three where there's no boundary layer nothing so everything. Everything uh, can be done easily. So um, for case three, for case three, I mean, I can mention. So case three, I, I can write here, right? Okay. So case three. So there are works by Swan and Cato. And there is also later i mean these are more or less the 70s and then there are some improvement by constantine um and i have a paper also um where i make a small improvement that I, i'll explain maybe a little i mean it's it's a small minor improvement but i think it's interesting so um what will be the the statement so I ca we can write a theorem um so i take s to be bigger than d over 2 plus 1 i write it in this in the in in the whole space in the whole space u0 is in um hs of Rd and T star is the time of existence, the time of existence for Euler with uh, with the initial data U0. So the time of existence of Euler of, of this system course without boundary conditions because we are uh, so this is my system Euler okay um, so then the conclusion is that um, for all T Um, for all t, we can find nu zero such that for all nu n less than nu zero, um, the Navier-Stokes system has a solution. Un is um, with values in Hs of Rd. Okay, I didn't write the solution of Euler, but the solution of Euler is also in this space. Um, and for all t in zero t um, the limit when t goes to uh, when n goes to infinity is u of t okay and this limit happens strongly in hs And uniformly in time, strongly in the HS, 
uniformly in T. Okay. Moreover, if I look at U n of T minus um, U zero of T. So U zero of T is the solution of Euler in HS minus two. This is less than some constant nu n. Okay. C, C just depends on u0. This depends on u0. Okay. Okay, so this is a, okay, so this is a statement which is okay, not very difficult to prove. Um, so I can tell you, for instance, OK, so this is more or less the statement, um, a simplified version of the statement in my paper. Like in my paper, what I, the improvement I have is the fact that this, the convergence happens in HS. Previous works <coughs> will get the convergence to happen in weaker spaces. Like you will, you will be solving the problem in HS, but you can prove the convergence in HS uh, in HS prime S prime less than S. Um, so let me explain how this works because then it will explain it, it will uh, show us what's the difficulty with uh, with boundaries. Now, um, why are we working in HS? Um, for the Euler system, for the Euler system, um, we can only solve in with some regularity. We cannot solve in L two, for instance. Um, of course, now in two D, we can we can solve if, if the vorticity is in L infinity. But if I am in three dimension or any dimension, um, we have to solve with that kind of regularity, okay? So, so at this level, um, I mean, one can, um, one can ask, okay, but for Navier-Stokes, we know, we know how to solve Navier-Stokes uh, in spaces without regularity, I mean, in spaces like L2. Can we, can we still do a problem with solutions of Navier-Stokes in L2? Uh, the answer is yes, but then what you need to do, for instance, I mean, um, but that's, that's, an, uh, that's, let's say, an extension of this result, then you can allow this to depend on N, right? And then make sure that this will converge to the initial data of Euler, and then, okay, th these are type of extension to this kind of results if one wants to. But um, I'm, I'm not going to do it because for this result, let me just stick to HS. I mean, I'll mention other results where we want to do things in energy spaces in L2, for instance. Okay, now how do we prove a result like this one? Um, okay, so the proof, uh, Actually, what I'm going to show you, I'll show you this, right? I'll show you this. Uh, this part, the fact that we can converge strongly in HS requires some extra work that I'll, I'll just mention briefly. But to prove that, um, that second, the second statement, I mean, it's very standard. I mean, it's very more or less what you do. Um, so you look at u n minus u. Uh, u u is u zero. Let me write it u zero. So a priori, a priori you don't know whether a priori you don't know whether Navier-Stokes you can solve it. A priori you cannot. You don't know that you can solve it till the time capital T. 
right? If you are solving Navier-Stokes in some smooth spaces, usually you have a time of existence that depends on n, that depends on the viscosity. So, um, so I'm not going into the, that detail, but um, all I'm going to show you is the energy estimate. So if I have energy estimate on the time zero capital T, then this will imply that I can solve on that time and get a solution. So um, <coughs> how the proof goes, I'm going to write energy estimate on this, on, on this. So, so we, are, we, we can write down an equation on this difference uh, by taking the un minus u0. And then we do energy estimates on the on the level um, okay then this will be less or equal than a uh, whole bunch of terms um, I don't know whether I should explain it. Wn so you add w0 uh, there is no epsilon n uh, Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Finish your computer. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a square lacking. Like DT of W n square. Ah, square. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. So, so just just what you do, you write an equation on W n. Uh, more or less, W n will be you you put a W. Uh, this will be a W. This will be a W. This will be u n grad u n minus u grad u. So you'll get some terms here. And then you do energy estimate. So without really <coughs> trying to write everything, but what you get, you get a term like um, this kind of terms. And then you get a term that comes from the viscosity applied to Euler, to the, to the Euler term. So the reason, the reason you can only do this at, uh, at, uh, at a lower regularity so you can ask why, why you cannot do this at the level HS? Why you can only do it at the level HS minus 2? Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, Th this is uh, 0. OK. So um, and this is 0, yeah. So the reason you can only do this at the level HS minus 2 is that you will be getting a term like this, coming from the Euler equation, right? Because somehow I added the Laplacian un, I'm, I'm going to write it as Laplacian wn, but then I have to pay this term on the right-hand side. And this term, uh, if my u0 is just in hs, my u0 is in hs, so um, if I, I need this to be controlled by u0 in hs, I can only do it in hs minus 2. So that's why that's all you can do. Um, here I'm not going to explain too much, but this is how you deal with the nonlinear term. Okay, so you have the nonlinear term, some term disappear, but, but somehow the nonlinear term you can control by this. Okay, so then from here, more or less, you, you can end up with an estimate like that. It's not very, it's not very difficult. Then you can end up, end up with an estimate like this. Um, then, then what people are able to say, uh, you can, I mean, proving, proving this. I said, okay, I'm going to skip it, but this is also not very difficult. That you can solve uh, the Navier-Stokes on that same time. And you can also solve it uniformly, like with bounds which are uniform in n. Um, then one can interpolate between 
uniform bound here and this to deduce um, like you can interpolate by some uniform bound here and this one to deduce for instance estimates of this nature so now if I take s prime between s minus 2 and s you can get c mu n to some power um, s minus s prime over 2 this is kind of things we see in uh, some of the early papers that um, your, your rate of convergence deteriorates with the space. Like in, eight, in uh, S minus 2, your rate is mu n, but in Hs prime, the rate is S minus S prime over 2. Then um, that's, for instance, in my paper from 2007. You can do some, you can use some, some regularization argument that I'm, I, I'm, I'm not planning to put, but like it takes maybe two pages. Uh, and you can even prove that you get a result like this. You can prove that you converge strongly uniformly in time in HS. It doesn't follow from this interpolation because from this interpolation, all what you get, you get that this is a constant. So you need to do, you need to do some regularization argument. I mean, basically, I, ca I can give in one minute the idea. The idea is that um, you don't want to compare your u n to u zero. So instead of comparing u n to u zero you will compare, um, maybe I can write it here. So you take your, you take the initial data u0, you replace it by some u0 delta. So u0 delta is a regularization of u0. I mean, since we are in the whole space, this you can do it just by based on Fourier analysis, for instance. You are in the whole space. But um, your u0 will be uh, bounded in HS. So, so for instance, it can, be, um, it can be some Fourier multiplier C less than uh, 1 over delta. Um, applied to u0, for instance. Okay, so you can take something, something like this. Um, so then, what you what you get, you get that you, this guy, in Hs plus one will be less than constant one over delta, and in Hs plus two, um, in general, in Hs plus i something like that okay if if you do it the way I mentioned it so <coughs> so then what you what you do you look at the solution um, V Delta is the solution of Euler with um, initial data u0 Delta Then what you do, you compare, you, you write that un minus u0. So this is the thing you want to prove that it goes, this is the thing you want to prove that it goes to 0 in Hs. You write it down as un minus v delta plus v delta minus u0. So then it becomes, this is, this is a property of Euler. This is like stability of Euler. The fact that V delta minus U0, the fact that V delta minus U0 goes to 0 when delta goes to 0 in HS. So this you can prove that 
this goes to zero when delta goes to zero in HS. Okay. Now this, now your V delta is in a better space. Your V delta, you, you can put it is even in HS plus two. But to, to get that it is in HS plus two, you have to lose some one over delta square. Okay, and then you optimize. Okay, there is some work. You optimize the value of delta in terms of the viscosity, and you can prove um, you can prove the the, comp the result. Okay, it's 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 very it's not very difficult, but it's uh, it's okay. Any questions? Of course, now the proof I mentioned here, one of the main things in this proof is the fact that there is no boundary terms, right? And you, co you can do all your integrations by parts, everything, um, everything is okay. Okay, um, now, <coughs> a question about the regularity. So the fact that S is bigger than D d over 2 plus 1, that's really the natural space, that's the natural Sobolev space for Euler, d over 2 plus 1. If we are in two dimension, if we are in two dimensions, we can, we can do better in two dimensions. So what can we say in two dimensions? In two dimensions, um, first of all, in two dimensions, T star is equal to infinity. Because Euler, we can solve it uh, globally. So T star, you can take it to be infinity. Also, um, we can, instead of taking the data to be in HS, we can take a data um, the curl of U0 is in L infinity. We can do a result where the curl of U0 is in L infinity. Um, of course, now usually the spaces we take, maybe we can, we, I mean, since we, if, we, if we are in the torus, this will be enough. If you are in the whole space, uh, usually we like to intersect it with some, let's say, L1 or, or at least some LP space. Um, so that you get some decay. Otherwise, I mean, if you are just in L infinity, okay, you, you, you don't have decay. Okay. Um, so then, then one can ask, one can more or less get some similar result. Um, it turns out, it turns out that um, the natural, the, the how how the result I showed you here extend to this case. Um, so there is a result. If I try to do this in L infinity L2, so I mean, if we think about it scaling wise, scaling wise, um, the curl of U0 in L infinity, this is like the curl of U0 in H1, same scaling. So I mean, this is like the result, it's as if I'm taking S to be 2 here. Right, I am in dimension two. It's as if I'm taking, at, in terms of scaling, it's like s equal two. So, so it's normal that I give you a result where this is l infinity l two because this is like s minus two. Uh, Hs, uh, Hs minus two. That's the space l two. So, um, 
So this result I'm mentioning here is due to Chemin, actually. So Chemin has a result. Um, but somehow, the result here, compared to the previous result I showed you, loses a little bit. So there is a constant. And then one can write nu n t. So this will be, this will be the natural, uh, I mean, the t here, uh, I could have write, written it also in the previous result. I could have written c nu n t. So this will be the natural extension from what I, what I showed you earlier. But um, this is actually not, not correct. Here there is a loss. So there is some exponential. So there is some exponential loss. Some exponential loss, meaning that the rate, the rate is decaying. So I mean, it's to the power exponential minus um, some constant times t. Okay, without the, all the constants depend on u zero. Um, and okay, this is due always to the fact that when you look at um, 2D Euler in when the curl is just in L infinity, uh, when the curl is just in L infinity, and you want to estimate the gradient of u in L infinity, you have to lose. You lose a little bit. You lose some log. And so the result is true. You can still do it, but you have to lose there. Um, however, there were results afterwards saying that, so this, this is due to Chemin, but then um, there were some improvements. That, that say that we don't get the loss if, if in addition we know if the solution of Euler, if the solution u0 of Euler is in Lipschitz space, is in L infinity. Right? So this is an extra information. Right? Usually, if you take the curl in L infinity, you don't know that the gradient is also in L infinity. But if, in addition, you know this, then there's no loss. Right? Then no loss in the exponent, no loss in, the, in terms of powers of mu. Okay, this is a result. Um, I think it was first proved by Costantin and Wu. Now, <coughs> um, I mean, it's not my plan to go into these directions, but I am mentioning this because, okay, I mean, it shows that. Okay, there are many possible extensions of these results. And um, let me, so, so, so you can ask, okay, when, when is this correct? When do we know, when do we know that um, u is in Lipschitz space? This leads us to, um, and there are a few works dealing with the case where we have what we call uh, vortex patches. Vortex patches, so this is where the vorticity is like, let's say, 1, and it's 0 outside. These are called vortex patches. And OK, I mean, there was there's a whole literature dealing with vortex patches. So in general, what we look at, we look at um, vorticity which is one in a domain and let's say if the domain is smooth at least c alpha um, so, uh, sorry c1 plus alpha 
So you take a boundary, you take some vorticity in a domain of regularity C1 plus alpha. Um, so for initial data like this, so of course now here the vorticity is just bounded. For initial data like this, um, it's known that one can solve Euler and keep the regularity of the, of the boundary. And due to this regularity of the boundary, the solution will be in n infinity Lipschitz. So I mean, first, this was also first proved by Schumann, the fact that you keep the regularity of the vortex patch. So um, yeah, so um, Right, so, so actually, um, yeah, I think, I think, okay, no, I need to, uh, right, I need a one half here that I forgot to put. There is a one half. Right, so for vortex patches, so then for vortex patches, there is no loss. The, the, that exponential loss also uh, doesn't hold. Okay. So these were. Um, um, these were more or less the results. Um, it turns out that that one half then was later improved in another paper uh, by Abidi and Donchamp. And I think the optimal one is three quarter. That result, like if one is really trying to find the rate of convergence for vortex patches, for vortex patches we can get that power to be uh, three quarter. Okay, but let me not go into uh, all this. Um, okay, now can we lower the regularity more? What if uh, the curl of U0 is in even weaker spaces? So, but by the way, here this this convergence, this convergence is happening in L2. So, so this kind of this kind of solutions really, we, we can we can look at solution of Navier-Stokes, which are just in the energy space. Right. So, um, what I mean by this, and what I mean by this is that, th for the results I'm mentioning there, more or less you can you can even take an initial data of Navier-Stokes in L2, like this. But then assume that um, this U0, you just need regularity on the U0. So it's really, for instance, the curl of U0, which is in, in that, those spaces. But of course, now the initial data of both equations do not match. So then you have to pay here something like the initial data of Navier-Stokes minus the initial data of Euler in L2. So you can more or less prove results also like this, in which case you are really dealing with um, um, weak solutions for Navier-Stokes. Okay. Now, if one wants to go um, even weaker, uh, I think okay, Jean Marc is here. So the the, the weakest result will is, I think, is due to Jean Marc, where uh, it's when you look at uh, vortex sheets, right? So if you take the initial data u zero, if the curl of u zero is in L one or or a measure, if the curl of u zero is in is a, is a measure, but you need 
uh, a signed measure, let's say. So if the curl of U0 is a signed measure, um, then it turns out that one can still solve Euler. And you can prove that solution of Navier-Stokes will converge to the solution of Euler when the viscosity goes to zero. But um, I mean, for me, that result is really, in a sense, is really like the weakest regularity you, you can allow so that you can prove that Navier-Stokes converges to Euler. So, so in, a, in a sense, like the results I mentioned, first, the first one was strong solutions, was really strong solutions. Then we went to results where we are dealing with um, energy space solutions, but we are imposing regularity at the limit system. So then, but the regularity on the limit system is slightly weaker. And now you can go even weaker. Um, and that uh, the, the result of Jean-Marc, where you can even deal with uh, so-called vortex, uh, vortex sheets, meaning that, uh, so it's not this picture, but your original vorticity can be, let's say, can be like a measure, can be a measure with some u0 in L2. But in this case, you need, uh, you need a sign condition. So you need omega0 to be uh, positive. Right? Or, or for instance, you can put positive plus some part in LP is totally bigger than one. So, um, so if you are in, in this kind of regularity, if you are in this kind of regularity, you can still, you can still just prove the convergence. You can still prove that uh, UN will converge to U0, but in L2, without rate, without, but with, yeah, weakly. Yeah, just weakly, so very weak, uh, very weak uh, result in this case. So in this case, you can prove that UN will converge weakly to U0 in L2. L2, L2, let's say. Okay. So this is uh, Jean Marc. Uh, yeah, um, we resuscitate you as Q1. Oh, both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, let's forget the LP, just the W positive. Okay, so uh, uh, what's co uh, W positive, does it, what it means? So it, I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, this will be like a whole lecture, like, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's some sort of, I mean, like, in, in a sense, okay, and uh, I mean, I, I like the, the, this result, I mean, and also the, the transition between, like, going from strong spaces to weak spaces. So here, a result like this is, is based on the following. You ask yourself, can I, I mean, a very natural question, because as I said, first I talked about strong solution for Navier-Stokes and Euler. But we know that Navier-Stokes has weak solutions. So I can look at Navier-Stokes in spaces like L infinity L2 intersected with L2 H1. So I can do just energy. So if I do just energy, um, if I do just energy, um, what are the estimates I will get? I will get I will get an estimate of this type of time t. So this will be equal or less or equal than the initial data. Or so let's say constant. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that uniformly in n, all what we can say is that we have some L infinity L2 bound. The bound we have here disappears at the limit. 
So you are not having, you are not getting that UN is in L2H1 uniformly. So the only uniform bound you have is UN is in L infinity L2. Now, <coughs> if you want to pass to the limit in this equation, I mean, in the sense of distribution, this will go to zero. This will be stays a pressure. This will converge to what we want. So then, what can we do with this? Of course, now, this term, due to the divergence free condition, this term you can write it, especially when we deal with weak solutions, we can write it as the divergence of UN tensor UN. Right? So you can write it down in this form. So this makes sense. Like this is L2, 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 so this product makes sense. So normally, it makes sense to ask yourself whether just from the bound you have here, you can pass to the limit in a term like that. But uh, this is weak convergence. Like if you are L infinity L2, all what you can say is that this converges weakly to U0. Weak in L2. So normally, it's not clear. It's not clear whether this will converge weakly to this. Right? Uh, and OK, so the, w the, the work of Jean-Marc is to, is to say that if, if you have that condition on the sign of the measure, then you can write this uh, I mean like it's more like a bilinear term and, uh, and there's a lot of work to prove that this actually happens using that the vorticity is uh, of course now if you if the vorticity is in lp p bigger than 1 then it's then it's okay if you know right so if omega 0 is in lp p strictly bigger than 1 this is correct. It's, it's not difficult. It's uh, two lines. Like you can prove that you keep some regularity and uh, you get it. Um, but to do it in M plus, uh, I mean, the problem is coming from possible concentrations. It's not oscillations, but the problem is concentration. Sorry. So what is the critical case that you can deal with? What is the critical thing? That's uh, L1. L1 is L1. the L1, L1 is the critical. L1 is the critical space here. But it's it's an issue of concentration, not not uh, oscillations. Okay. So so this is um, a, a, as of now all what we talked about um, has nothing to do with the boundary. Right, so all what we talked about has to do more with strong solution versus weak solutions. And um, okay, now what happens, why, why this breaks down if we have a boundary? Why this breaks down if we have a boundary, right? So, um, Let's um, okay. So let's keep the boundary conditions there. So <coughs> we talked earlier about this equation on um, on W n. Um, so now the case with boundary. So, so l l let's, let's look at one, the boundary condition one. So if I try to do anything, um, even like if I am in two dimensions and I want to do some estimate like this one, what I will try to write down, I will try to write down an equation on, on this guy. So, So here I, I will I will be writing a term like um, 
u0 um, the other way around. Um. Okay. Okay, so this is how you write your nonlinear term. The difference between um, un grad un and u0 grad u0, right? And then you put minus nu n Laplacian grad n plus the pressure. So, of course, I mean, these are the WMs. Now, um, this is the equation on WN that I, I didn't write uh, earlier. Now, this equation, if you want to do um, any type of energy estimates, like what we've been doing there, let's say if you want to do energy estimates in L2, you want to multiply by WN and integrate by parts. But then the issue is that this guy will not integrate by part. You cannot integrate by part because now this doesn't vanish. Wn doesn't vanish on the boundary, right? Because Wn, Wn is Un minus U0. And on the boundary, U0 doesn't vanish, right? Only the normal part of U0 vanishes. So, um, so we cannot use, we cannot do energy estimates, okay? Um, so what can one do then? One, what can one do? Um, I'll mention some results. I mean, th there is a very interesting result. Uh, it's a very short note by Cato. Um, so there is a result by Cato that I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit about it from, I think, 84, if I remember well, um, who, who proves somehow what we, it, it's more like, it's more like in the spirit of an if theorem. If something happens, then the conversions takes place. Um, so let me, let me mention this result. Uh, it, it's one of the it's one of the it's one of these results that is now well um, it's called the Cato criteria, and it has uh, it has also very nice physical interpretation actually. Like the physical interpretation of the result is very interesting. So, the Cato criteria says the following. Um, so, so, of course, here we are, we are in a situation where Euler has a nice solution, right? So Euler has a solution in some HS space, nice. So it's, it's not a question about regularity of the limit problem. The limit problem can be in a very, very smooth. Um, so T star again is the time of existence of Euler. Time of existence of Euler. And Again, I take t less than t star. Then we have the following three, three statements which are equivalent. Um, Un goes to U0 in L2 uniformly in time. Okay, 
So if the convergence takes place in L2, this is equivalent to, to the fact that the, the energy dissipation, the energy dissipation um, Okay, so 1 and 3, 1 says that if Un goes to 0 strongly, uh, um, if Un goes to U0 in L2 uniformly in time, that statement is equivalent to the fact that the energy dissipation, the energy dissipation goes to 0. But the striking thing coming from um, Cato is that it's not necessary to check that the energy dissipation goes to zero in the whole space, but, but just in, in a small strip around the boundary. And this strip is of size of the viscosity. Nu. So basically, gamma nu is the set of x in omega such that the distance between x and the boundary is less than nu. Okay. So I mean, more or less, it's clear that three um, three implies right 3 implies 2 so if you if you are saying that the energy dissipation goes to 0 in omega it's also clear that the energy dissipation in a strip will go to 0 um, but what Euler is uh, what Cato is capable of proving is that this is enough to prove that this holds I'm sorry, you uh, new is new n, right? Or yeah, yeah, okay. What, what I call new is always, it's, it's a new n, yeah. Um. And the strap is also new n. Hmm? Yeah, 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 always. Like new is a new n. Okay, so, um, so this is the result of Cato that... Um, Donc c'est en dimension 3 et 4. Uh, uh, deux, uh, three. No, in any dimension. I mean, the dimension here doesn't uh, matter. You can do it. Uh, I mean, if you want to write oil Navier Stokes in five dimensions, you can. I mean, the, the, the dimension doesn't uh, doesn't uh, enter. So, what's the idea? What's the idea of the proof of such a result? So th the idea is very simple. Uh, actually, I mean, he, I mean, it's it's a seven-page uh, note that he wrote, like in some proceeding. But but it turns out that th this is a became now a very famous result uh, in the subject. Um, the idea is to say, okay, I don't like. There's something we don't like about this. What the thing that we don't like about this Wn is that it doesn't vanish on the boundary. Okay, so then he said, "Okay, um, I'll add a corrector. I'll add." But actually, what Cato used is a corrector um, that doesn't satisfy any particular equation. He just added a corrector. So. Um, Maybe I'll write that so that we keep um, the equation. Okay. So he said, um, instead of using u0, I'm adding to u0 some something I'm going to write 
B nu, B because it's like a boundary layer. Um, and now this is equal to zero on the boundary. Okay. So basically you come close to the boundary, you come close to the boundary and you, you add a small corrector there. Um, I'm not going, ac actually I'm not going to give exactly his construction. I'm not going to give his construction because I'm going to use, um, I'm going to mention another result, uh, another result that I proved where um, I use an idea similar to his corrector. But basically this is more or less the idea. You add a corrector and now instead of looking uh, your definition of Wn now will be, you will look at um, okay. And now this guy vanishes on the boundary. This is equal to zero on the boundary. Um, but now, now if I try to write down the equation on this guy, I will get all bunch of other terms. But because this guy, for now, doesn't satisfy any equation. This guy doesn't satisfy any equation. Um, so I get some extra terms here. So um, um, And they have some other terms, actually. I'm not going to write everything. Um, yeah, actually, OK. So, so then you try to adjust and you, you try to find what is the right B nu. But basically, at the end, at the end, what the B nu will be, what the B nu will be is, um, is more or less some u zero that you you make decay close to the boundary. Okay, so so your b so your b will be uh, will be zero here will be zero here, but it's equal to u zero um, will be equal to u zero here, and then it decays inside. Okay, so le le let me not give um, the whole construction here because I want to give another result. There's another result that I want to mention which is, it's not an if theorem but it's a, uh, it's, is time what? Is time no, no, time dependent. The B nu is time dependent. Uh, U0, or is time dependent? Yeah, yeah, U0 is, is, is the solution of Euler. So this is time dependent, so the B nu is also time dependent. So that's why I said there are other terms. So for instance, there will be a term which is dt of B plus some many other error terms. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, those terms are fine. I mean, at the end, like the, 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 the important term will come, there will be a term coming from this one. There will be like two terms, two, two main terms. One when the derivative, when this hits here, and then there is another term when this derivative hits here. And then you have to adjust. But in a sense, I'm going to give you another result 
uh, where I'll mention a little bit, slightly more in detail, the proof. Which, I mean, my, my result was also inspired by, by Cato. Okay. Um, Here, a B new is also B new n. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Always a new is a new n. New, new is a new n. Yeah. But it depends on n. So it's really, uh, right? Okay, it depends on n. So it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's supported in, in this region. Okay, so the next result is um, is more or less motivated by um, by works done in um, I mean, if one looks at the way at um, I replace the viscosity by. So I'll, I'll explain now the setup. Okay, so I'm going to look at the problem in the half space omega is r three plus. Okay, so omega my omega is the upper the upper half plane. So this is my omega, is the upper half plane. But, and the viscosity, I'm going to replace it by a viscosity in the z direction and a viscosity in the y, in the xy direction. Okay, so this is a viscosity here and a different viscosity here. Okay, so uh, this is one of the reasons why I like using new n. The reason I, I, instead of saying new, because then as n vary, I can allow new n and eta n to go to zero uh, differently. So then um, the statement, the statement um, I prove So I have to assume I have to assume that um, so I assume that new eta new over eta go to zero when n go to infinity. So I'm not necessarily putting n. So nu means nu n, eta means eta n. So I'm assuming that, so the viscosity goes to zero, but also this ratio goes to zero. Then, then um, u n goes to u zero um, in L2. Uniformly in T. Okay. Right, and also the the conclusion that we have from uh, the fact that square root of eta, the grad x y of u n, square root of go to zero in L two L two. So, um, so compared to the result of Cato, the result of Cato is an if, it's like an if theorem. It says, it's saying that this convergence is equivalent to this. So if you check this, then you can prove this, okay? Um, so this is a result um, that I proved in, uh, 
uh, yeah, it's almost 20 years ago, so it's 98, um, says that if we replace the viscosity by another diffusion, but where we uh, somehow we are putting slightly more viscous effect in the x, y direction, so I'm, I'm assuming that nu goes to zero faster than eta. So somehow I'm keeping slightly more viscosity in x, y. Then we can prove the result. It turns out like normally like, <coughs> especially when I, when I explain the parental system and so on, um, usually all what we talked about, all what we'll say about parental will also apply to this, to, to this, um, to this problem with different viscosities. Now, physical, uh, whether this is physically relevant or not, um, the answer is yes. Like if we think about the atmosphere, all atmospheric flows, uh, for all atmospheric flows, it makes sense to assume that you have different viscosity in the vertical and in the um, horizontal direction, right? So, um, so, so uh, as a model, it's very, very physical model. Okay, any questions about the statement? Okay, I'll try to give you a proof of it. Uh, okay. And actually the proof, I mean, if you see this proof, I mean, the proof is really, uh, inspired also from the result of Cato, right? Okay. Um, let's see, which, yeah, question? Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, then I need, um, I need the W equation, but um, yeah, of course, yeah, here I didn't insist on it, but uh, I'm looking at uh, all what I'm talking about is with, uh, with the Dirichlet boundary condition, right? So this is the problem with Dirichlet boundary condition. So I'm looking at the problem in the half space we are in the half space with the Dirichlet boundary condition. So, okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is to construct this Bn, what I call Bn there. So what do I, what, what I want? I want that Bn, I'm calling N now because I have nu and eta, or I will call it B of nu and eta. So let me call it just Bn. So I need that Bn at z equals 0 plus W at z equals 0. I need this to be equal to 0. Okay. And I need that B when z is equal to infinity, I need this to be 0. I need it to decay. I also need that my Bn doesn't carry energy, so I need my Bn to go to zero in an infinity L2. Okay. When n goes to when n goes to infinity. Okay. So so more or less, it's more or less clear. Um, and this is again, it's not coming from solving any equation. I mean when I start talking about Prentol, Prentol is really based on the idea that I need something that satisfies a particular equation. So my Bn, I will just take it to be, I mean, the simplest thing, exponential minus z over square root of nu uh, xi. C is a parameter that I'm going to choose. Um, 
Does that make sense? So you just put some boundary layer, some um, This is like the simplest boundary layer you can think about, but that doesn't solve any equation. It's not coming from an equation. Just you take, just you have the boundary condition that is bothering you. This is not zero. And so you add to it this. So then if you look at this plus Bn, this will be equal to zero on z equals zero. Okay, so then um, okay, so then let me call W B to be uh, uh, sorry. Uh, what I'm calling W is U zero. Okay, so I'm just changing notation so that I don't carry too many. Okay, W is U zero. So then WB is this W plus Bn. Let me write down, let me write down what is the equation satisfied by that by, by it. Okay. So So this is equal to what? Of course, now um, I have the dt b, which is not there. I have now the b grad w, which is one of the terms here. I have the w grad b. Uh, actually, I have the B grad the whole thing. Okay. So this term normally has four terms. This has four terms. Only one of them is coming from W, which is W grad W. I get the three others. And then I have the viscosity terms, which are Minus the pressure, right? So this is the equation satisfied by this uh, W B. Now the reason I write it like this because now I can take, I can now compare it to the Navier-Stokes, right? So then I can make the difference between the two equations. Hmm? Yeah, it's here. The B grad B is here. Okay. okay, so okay, so then we do the then um, maybe I'll skip some of the details I think because um, yeah, let me jump right. So let me jump to the equation on on. Uh, So then I'm calling uh, V, V which is Vn is Un minus, minus this guy. Okay. Then um, so you, you take the equation on Un and you subtract this uh, Wb. And then you do energy estimates. 
Okay, I'm I'm skipping some I'm skipping the calculations, so but okay, so what do you get? And I integrate in time. I integrate in time. So I end up with with this with this equation. L2 in space. Um, OK. This is less than what? The initial data. OK. And then um, I have a bunch of terms mostly coming from multiplying these things by, by v, all right? So I have plus OK, so I have terms like this. Um, yeah, you have also terms like these here. I have to put yeah, all, all the other terms here I should put also. W grad B. And B. OK. And they have other terms, other terms coming from uh, the UN minus this. OK. Um, okay, let me, right, so, okay, I have some other terms, but, um, I'm, I'm worried of giving you every, all, all the, there's one step, or, or let me insist on the important terms. Maybe that, that will be better than trying to. OK, normally, normally as of now, so I, I wrote, I wrote, um, what I'm missing, I'm missing un grad un minus, right? This I didn't write. And this you write as un grad un minus like a b plus um, plus un minus. Right? You write it in this form. Okay. And this guy will be my Vn. This is Vn. Both of these are Vn. This is V. This is V. Now this term disappears when you do energy estimates, right? When you do your energy estimate, when you do your energy estimate, this term disappears. So normally I just I only need to add this guy. So then I have times V. Okay. Just one, uh, one question. One question. You don't. Uh, your corrector uh, is, uh, is not uh, divergence free. Huh? That's true. 
as uh, yeah, you, you, you are right, you are right. Yeah, yeah. So that's something so come high. The roads here is almost correct, but not completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's true. That's I'm, I'm hiding that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but what you said is correct. Yeah, normally I have to make it. Uh, I have to play with it a little bit to um, to adjust it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I just want to insist on the important terms, right, and show you the main idea. So, um, what are the important terms? So, there will be a term coming from this. So the first term coming from this is, uh, I mean, clearly the, the most difficult things is when you are taking z derivatives here. Because when you are taking a z derivative, there is that small parameter in u xi will comes out. So the difficult term, the difficult term here is v3 dz b v. Not DZW is not a problem. It's more like the DZB that is problem, right? So this is one of the terms. So what what can we do with this guy? So I, I, I'll show you. So the idea about terms like this is that we are going to use that V3 and V vanish on the boundary. Both vanish on the boundary. So what I'm going to write it down is I write it like this. So I'm going to use... Right, so this is the idea. Omega again is the half, up, the upper half space, and then we use um, Hardy type inequality to bound this by dz v three l two. Um, dz v L2, and I'm going to put this in L infinity. Now, this guy, when I differentiate, I lose, right? 1 over square root of new uh, xi. But when I multiply by z, square I gain. So actually, this will be square root of new xi w in L infinity. Uh, so, Xi here is uh, a constant, or no? Xi, hmm? what's a Xi? Xi is a constant that I'm going to choose. I'm going to adjust. So, so basically, the idea of Xi is that it's really telling you what is the size of your boundary layer. I mean, it's, it's an imaginary boundary layer because it's, it's just boundary layer that work makes the calculation work. It doesn't have physical uh, meaning, but it will make the proof works. Okay, now, uh, what's now the good thing? This guy, um, this guy, what I'm going to do with this guy, I'm going to use that I am divergence free and replace this by the derivative in xy of v. I mean, bounded by. using divergence-free condition. This is very important because somehow um, I control this better than the z derivatives. That's where, this is really where uh, the having eta Laplace in xy will help because now I control this better than I control this. And then I can use uh, some Cauchy Schwarz. I put uh, nu over 4 dz l2 square. 
and here I have C C um, So, so you can see, like, if I want a term like this to be absorbed by the viscosity, if I need this to be absorbed by the viscosity, it's better than this guy is less than eta. This guy should be less than eta, okay? This guy should be less than eta if I want this uh, to be absorbed by, by this guy. So you see, this, this, this term, the term coming from DZV, I know how to absorb it by the first part of the viscosity. I need also this guy to be absorbed. Okay. So this is how I deal with this term. Now, the other problematic term, this is not a big problem, actually. The, the other problem is this term. These are the two main terms, like I said, this and this. This is the other main term, so let me explain it. Let me do it here. Okay. So that term, okay, so it's, it's like this. So I can integrate it by part. Um, I integrate by parts and then I integrate. So I uh, integrate by parts. Um, so then I can put dZv square plus some constant nu. Right? So of course now this I can absorb it um, in the viscosity and this guy is less than what? This guy is less than some constant nu. Now when I take a derivative, there is the factor square root of eta xi that comes. Um, um, yeah, times W in L infinity. Okay. Of course, now, when, you, when I do the derivative, there is this factor that comes. Normally, it comes with the square. But then when I integrate, when I do the L2 here, I regain one of these factors. So that's why it appears with the square root, OK? OK. OK. So. I need this term to go to zero. And that's the only way. I mean, because this term, there's nothing I can do with it except that it has to go to zero, right? I need that term to go to zero. So, so now the conclusion, the conclusion is that if I take the conclusion is what? I'm going to take C to be eta divided by C times, let's say, 4, right? This is my conclusion. I take C to be eta divided by this. So then this guy becomes eta over 4. Then it can be absorbed. But this is now eta. C is like eta times a constant. So. Um, then I see the constant, the C here. So this will be this will be like some constant square root of 
right? So if this constant, if this also goes to zero, then I am done, right? So then, then the then the convergence will take place. So that's more or less how the now this how how this result uh, goes. And um, I mean, if you if you understand this, that's exactly how that's exactly how you can do the the Cato criteria. Basically, the Cato criteria, the Cato criteria here here there is no if theorem. This is uh, this is there is no if theorem. In the Cato criteria, in the Cato criteria, the difference <coughs> with this result I'm showing you is that it's really at this step. All the, all the rest of the calculation is more or less the same. It's really at this step that instead of keeping here, instead of keeping here um, something that you know that it goes to zero, here you will keep something around the boundary. Uh, it's really at this step where you, you will say, OK, uh, I know that this goes to 0. The, the energy dissipation around the, the boundary goes to 0. Then you, you deduce that the convergence takes place. OK. Um, now, um, let me let me mention a um, few other results about the inviscid limit again. Um, yeah, I didn't give a plan of uh, of the lectures, but um, let me just say a few words about the plan of the other lectures and then finish with um, today's lecture about the the. Um, uh, about the inviscid limit. So, so uh, Thursday, Thursday we'll be talking about Prentor. So, first of all, I will give you the derivation of the system, and then some well posedness result, uh, different kind of well posedness results. So this will be uh, lecture two. Lecture three and lecture four, I, mean, I don't know which w w in which order because both of will be more or less uh, independent. Uh, one of them will be blow up for Prentor. So I'll give two kind of, uh, two kind of results about blow up for Prentor, one about um, uh, stationary solutions, uh, stationary, I mean, one about the time dependent and one about the time independent. And then uh, I will go back to inviscid limit, but with Prentor. With Prentor. So these are, I, I mean, of course, now the two results I showed today, like Cato and or this result, both are results where you prove the convergence. But there's nothing about there's nothing about the boundary. So it's true that B appears here, but B at the end is just used to allow the integration by part. But I'm not justifying B. I'm not I'm not saying that the B here has any physical meaning. And you can see it from the result because the B itself. The way the B is chosen, it goes to zero in L infinity L2. And my result is to say that uh, the result we are proving is to say that um, UN goes to U0 in L2. I mean, U0 is, 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 uh, is W, is the same as W. So the B here is, is not seen, right? In this result, the B, you don't see it. Of course, now there are more precise convergence results, but requiring more regularity where we can also see the part coming from Prento. OK, now um, I want to end with a few extra things about 
this limit from Navier-Stokes to Euler. Okay, um, and it's more like in the spirit of um, the result of uh, Jean-Marc, but even weaker. So what happens if all you know? What happens if what happens if I give you? What happens if if our starting point? So 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 now uh, I'm forgetting about the boundary again. I'm forgetting about the boundary. Take take a problem like this. I mean I don't need. Uh, the two viscosities, I just put Laplace in here. Okay, so take a sequence, um, take some solution of Navier-Stokes um, with an initial data in L2. And it can be the same initial data. What happens to this when n goes to infinity? Right? Let's say put the same initial data. What happens to this when n goes to infinity? Now, um, in this setup, of course, Euler is not well posed if, um, if I just take a data which is in L2. Right? I need more regularity so that I can uh, construct some solution of Euler. So, um, so it's not clear, it's not clear what happens. And again, the difficulty you comes from this term, un times un. What happens to what happens to the limit of un times un when n goes to infinity? Now, in the literature, there are at least, I mean, people thought about these problems, and um, there are attempts to somehow describe this limit or to describe what happens. Okay. Um, so one attempt is by Diperna and Maida. Diperna Maida introduced a notion which um okay, I mean some has some um, introduced the notion with of so-called measure-valued solution for Euler. Right? So, basically, okay, without going into the detail of it, I mean, it's more sophisticated than what I'm saying, um, I know that my UN will converge weakly to some, by just compactness. By just compactness, I will say that my UN converges weakly to some U0 when N goes to infinity in L infinity L2. Or let's say in L2, L2. Okay? But I cannot deduce that there is strong convergence. All I can, all, all, all what I can say is that there is weak convergence. And okay, if you have weak convergence, one object that characterizes weak convergence is the Young measure. So Diperna and Maida they introduced some Young measure. Mm. And there is a whole construction of a Young measure that will that they will call a measure-valued solution for Euler. And more or less, it captures the lack of strong convergence. It captures the. Um, so this was one notion um, that okay. I mean, was I mean was introduced maybe I would say more than thirty years ago, like more like in the eighties. Okay, I mean it was used a few times. Like it came back, it comes back from time to time. This was one notion. Another notion. Um, of so-called very weak solution to Euler is a notion by Pierre Williams. So Pierre Louis constructed something that he called dissipative solution for Euler. And um, and it's also 
these kind of solutions are used to try to justify this kind of limit. Um, so, yeah, but maybe I will not, I'm, I'm not planning to go into these uh, notions, but, but somehow these are notions that people try to construct to try to capture what happens in this limit. Because like, with all what we are going to do with parental and the question of weak convergence always remains, right? Whether we construct parental or not, or what we, I mean, the question about just weak convergence in this sense, uh, and it, in a sense we are, st we still don't understand uh, where is the lack of strong convergence. I mean, of course, now here, when what I presented here is without boundaries. The boundary is not present here. Um, of course, this kind of uh, construction of the Pernamida or Lyons can be combined with the boundary. Um, okay, let me stop here. Sorry, I have a question concerning the your assumption. So, is it possible to find uh, any other construction of B of N such that? Uh, uh, let me ask the first question. So, can you uh, consider your no 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 on the on the other blackboard? Ah. So, concerning the the last estimate. So, is it here the only? The only place where you use the last assumption nu over it goes to zero. Yeah, it's only this term. Okay, so, so is it possible to find uh, some other b of n such that you can avoid this assumption? I don't. Uh, okay, I mean, like, uh, of course, now the, uh, the this is not the only choice. Um, I can take it. I don't have to wait to take it equal. I have to take it less than, right? I can, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it's, there is only one choice of length. I mean, and, and that's, that's also, uh, this also shows that uh, this boundary layer doesn't have really what I will call like physical meaning, right? So if you want, uh, you can take it less as long as, as long as this goes to zero, right? So you have, you have room in, in terms of your choice. But somehow the choice given there is the, be is the best because it gives you the best decay of the error. So if you want to estimate the error, like in the paper I wrote, like I, I estimate the error and this term appears in the error. Uh, this estimate depends on the construction of B. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, and I think no one knows how to construct a B if you if you if you don't impose something like this, of course. Now I didn't show it, but the Cato Cato has a construction of a B very similar to this one, more or less the same actually. Cato has a construction of a B similar, and um, his the convergence will take place as with the if theorem, right? So somehow you are. At some point, you are replacing the study of this term that I have here by another term, and you have to check that that term vanishes on the boundary, and that that the sort of dissipation close to the boundary vanishes, so that you can prove the convergence. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, yes. Okay. So Thursday we start with Prentor.